Chapter 91 You are listening at NovelFull.audio I was surprised. I stared blankly at Maria Patron's necklace hanging on her neck. Why is Shannonette's necklace hanging over there? It was absurd and I was overwhelmed. Why is the necklace? In my murmur, Maria Patron touched her necklace with her fingertips. Perhaps I misunderstood my gaze at the piercing, but she had a superior smile around her mouth. What a lovely necklace, isn't it? I've been praised by other ladies for having a good eye today. Dot it's a beautiful necklace. The ladies with Maria Patron were a little upset but admitting that the necklace was a pretty good thing. It was Lombardy's madam's item, and now Sean Annette has it, so it's a modest necklace, not a really simple one. Still, it was a necklace of good quality enough for ordinary nobles. It was even more than enough for a woman like Maria Patron. Where did you get that necklace? I immediately grabbed my hair and wielded it, holding back what I wanted to yell at her to give the necklace. Thanks to it, my voice was shaking to pieces. Oh, this necklace is not something you can just pay for. Maria Patron said, furtively covering it with her hands as if I were greedy for her stuff. Another noblewoman next to her asked to check. Did you say that Lady Patron's precious person gave it to you as a gift? Yes, it was my birthday not too long ago. I doubted my ears. What did I just hear? Who gave you that necklace? So, Lady Patron's lover gave you that necklace? Yes. Crazy. Vestian son of a bitch. Point one, even a cannibal living in the forest would turn around spitting phlegm because he'd get sick if he ate something like you. Point three, he stole the things left by his wife's mother and gave them to his lover. How rotten can a man do such a thing? Point one, it's a very special thing that's been handed down to his family for generations. It was the moment when the legacy of Madame Lombardy turned into a family heirloom of the Schultz. I was so angry that I became dizzy. Seeing Maria Patron using it, she seemed doesn't know what necklace it was. If only she knew that was Shannonette's necklace. And she wouldn't have acted like this if she knew it was my grandmother's necklace. No matter how stupid and thoughtless she is. She wouldn't walk in front of me wearing that necklace and recognize it. So Vestian lied to Maria Patron about the origin of the necklace. Then Maria Patron spoke in a shy voice. Although we have a lot of time apart for reasons. He's a person who makes me feel loved for such a special gift, too she deserves what she does. You have to speak properly. The situation is that Vestian is a married man with two children, not love, but an affair. And Maria Patron thinks I don't know about their affair, and she's splitting it up. She is stealing Lombardy's money, in front of Shannonette's nephew. In front of me, Florentia Lombardy. Okay. Vestian wasn't the only one to be punished. I thought for a moment about how to deal with that brazen woman. It just so happens that today was the perfect day. When the plan came up, my head, filled with anger, calmed down. I took a glass of fruit juice and poured it over Maria Patron's clothes. I didn't even pretend to be a mistake. I'm holding back what I want to pour into her face. Gee, what are you? Embarrassed, Maria Patron grabbed her own dress dripping with juice and tried to argue with me. I gave her a big smile. Oh, mistake. And I made an offer to Maria Patron that she would never refuse. Your clothes got dirty by mistake, so I'll compensate you. You know how much these clothes cost. Premium dress at the Gallahan clothing store. Maria Patron's mouth, which was bursting with complaints, is closed. I'll make up with that. Let's go to Gallahan clothing store. Well, then. I got up from my seat first. Then ladies who were next to her asked. Can we come with you? I answered with a nod. Yes, go ahead. The more spectators the better to spread the rumors. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, huh? Did you ask for 8,000 gold, now? Vestian's startled voice roared in the pellet's office. Yes, that's right. But Clarivan's voice in response was calm. 
I knew you'd ask for a certain amount of money in exchange for the right of the mine. But it is, 8,000 gold. For a very large number, Vestian gulped. Isn't that too greedy? At Vestian's rebuke, Clarivan seemed to laugh in vain. Who wants to steal other people's things first? He must be told that he is too greedy. However, Clarivan remained calm, recalling what Florentia had ordered. It's a secret. Pellet is not really my company. Well, then. Can't I have the money to build a business like this and buy a mine? Of course, it was invested by many people. Clarivan said deftly. In fact, Pellet's sole investor and the owner was Florentia. They say that if I want to change the mining company, I have to pay that much. Well, when is the due date? You have to give it to me today. No, it doesn't make sense. How can I get that much money today? The Vestian burst in anger, but Clarivan just shrugged once. We have decided to have one day a year for investors to gather. They're all busy people. And that's tonight. Even though it's true, how can I make big money today? Vestian was in tears. He is very envious of diamond mining rights. Moreover, he wanted to divorce Seananette Lombardy as soon as possible and gain freedom. Point one that's why he wanted to get Pellet's mining rights. 8,000 gold was about the same amount of money that he had taken away from Lombardy. But that kind of money can't be in hand in cash right now. Clarivan spoke with sweet words to Vestian, who couldn't think of the right move no matter how hard he tried. What if you take a loan? A loan. Isn't it possible at Lombardy's bank with the confidence of Vestian? You're Lulak Lombardy's son. In. Law. Clarivan was right. Lombardy Bank will lend him that amount of money. You'd better do a loan first and pay off a loan gradually. Clarivan's calm voice captivated Vestian with the idea that the best way is to get a loan in an instant. To Vestian, Clarivan spoke in a more subdued voice. If you take the mining rights and start taking some of the diamond profits, it's a quick fill. That's true. If you miss this opportunity, you'll have to wait a year. He shouldn't do that. Vestian bit his lower lip in nervousness. And after a while, as already determined, Vestian rose from his chair. I'll go to the bank. Don't go anywhere and wait. Well, I had a previous engagement. Well, I see. Vestian was in a hurry. Luckily there was a Lombardy bank not far away. Running there in a hurry, Vestian hurried to the branch manager. The branch manager, who had known each other, responded kindly and bewildered by Vestian's sudden visit. If you'd let us know in advance, we'd have visited the mining company. What brings you here, Sir Vestian? I'm here to get a loan. I need about 8,000 gold, is that possible? 8,000 gold. The branch manager looked at Vestian for a moment and nodded. Then it'll be a credit. Are you all right? I don't care, so please write 8,000 gold in a draft. It was not until Vestian's mouth that a smile spread. It's so comfortable being Lombardy's son. In. Law at times like this. Vestian, who hurriedly signed and filled out the papers, quickly returned to Pellet with a bill he had received. Luckily, Clarivan was still sitting there. Here you are. That's enough, right? Clarivan, who was deeply moved by a bill placed on the table, nodded slowly and said, Yes, I'll deliver this money to investors. Clarivan's smile was especially strong, tapping his chest containing bills. Asterisk 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 the branch of Gallahan clothing store in the capital was particularly large and colorful. Maria patron and women, who were treated well by the staff of the clothes store thanks to me, feeling proud. Maria patron rummaged for a while in front of a hanger with a premium dress before picking one. I like this dress. It was also one of the most expensive dresses in the premium line because it had small emeralds along the chest line of the dress. For your information, the dress Maria Patron was wearing a while ago were affordable. But I nodded my head gladly. Hmm isn't that Tia? 
It was because I knew this would happen. I turned around slowly. What's Tia doing here? Just in time, my grandfather and father, who were entering the capital branch of the Galahan clothing store, were approaching me with surprise. Chapter 92 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Grandpa Dad I ran to my father and grandfather and greeted them gladly. I knew in advance that the two were going to be here today. That's why I brought Maria Patron here. If you had told me in advance, your father and grandfather would have been in a little bit of a hurry. My father patted me on the head and said. I wasn't on the plan either, but I came all of a sudden. Looking back, saying so, I could see Maria Patron and the ladies going berserk. Dot Galahan Lombardy, the owner of Galahan clothing stores spread throughout the empire, and Lulac Lombardy, the owner of the household. They were whispering among themselves. My father asked me when he saw such an eternity. There. Are they Tia's friend? It's not the right age for me to hang out with them. Questions arose on my father and grandfather's faces. Then Maria Patron and the ladies approached carefully. I pointed to Maria Patron and said. I spilled juice on Lady Patron's clothes. So I invited her and her friends to buy new clothes. Is it okay, Dad? My father looked at Maria Patron's clothes and said a little surprised. Of course, it's okay. Oh, your clothes are messed up. My father stopped talking. His eyes were on Maria Patron's necklace. It seemed like he was mistaken to keep looking at the necklace with shaky eyes. I'm a little upset because it's my favorite clothes, but it's okay. Even though Maria Patron was saying so, my father couldn't keep talking. Perhaps he was not sure. But the necklace was Shannonette's. Then it was time for Maria Patron to say and go back to the premium dress. There you go. Grandfather called Maria Patron in a low voice. Come here. Grandfather's gaze was exactly stuck in one place. Look at the necklace you're wearing. Asterisk 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 Lolak Lombardy glanced over the young lady in front of him. The dress she was wearing was stained with juices, but she was brave enough to stand up with the tip of her chin slightly raised. However, she is not able to face his eyes properly and avoids eye contact. She was already afraid of Lolak. She wants to pretend to be confident, but in the end, she's not a strong person. It was a common type. Lulak asked in a calm voice. My granddaughter spilled a drink on your clothes. Yes, there was such a small commotion. I apologize for that. Oh, you don't have to do that. She compensated me for my clothes like this way. Lulak nodded at Maria Patron's words. Yeah, that's a relief. Then can you answer my next question honestly? What's your question? What's your relationship with my son? In law? Yes. Maria Patron's voice shook loudly. It was as if she had already been caught hiding her secret. I'll give you a chance, assuming it was a mistake for a while. No, I don't know what you're talking about. No. Think again. Lulak looked into Maria Patron's face and said. I asked you about your relationship with my son. In law, Bestian Schultz, and you'd better give me a much better answer than just being clumsy, one, ugh. Now Maria Patron was completely crushed by Lolak's gaze. Her body trembled, her feet faltered as if she wanted to run away right now. But there was no sign of sympathy for her from Lolak. The moment Maria Patron approached, Lolak knew. The fact that the necklace she's wearing belongs to her daughter, Shannonette. And the next thing that came to mind was Vestian. To be exact, she greeted him at the pellet banquet. That necklace belongs to his wife. It belongs to Shannonette, my eldest daughter. Well, that can't be right. You must be mistaken. At Maria Patron's words, Lulak shook his head. I don't know how the person who gave you the necklace explained it. That's my wife's keepsake. The initials of my wife Natalia Lombardi are engraved on the back. Maria Patron turned the necklace upside down with trembling hands. It was as Lulak said. 
there were small initials engraved that she wouldn't know. If it's difficult, I'll give you a choice. Will you become a thief who broke into Lombardy and stole the necklace and be handed over to the Imperial Guard? Maria Patron's heart pounded when she was told about the security guard. Or confess your relationship with Vestian Schultz. Well, that's. Maria Patron was biting her lower lip tightly. Vestian has always called him old man and has told her to ignore Lolak Lombardy. So Maria Patron always thought Lombardy was a joke. A stupid old man who doesn't even know that Vestian and herself are stealing money right under his nose. But Maria Patron realized that it was herself who was stupid. Lulak Lombardy was a scary man. That intimidating feeling that made her unable to breathe right now was telling that. What the hell has she done? That's against Lombardy. She has regretted it, but it's too late. Maria Patron closed her eyes tightly and trembled. If it's hard to say everything here, just answer one question. Was it Vestian Schultz who gave you that necklace? Maria Patron nodded slowly at Lulak's question. Galahan. Lulak Lombardy called his son, his face was hardened with anger. Point two, take care of Tia. Let's go back to the mansion. With you, of course. Maria Patron's body flinched at the last word. Sorry, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Lulak said coldly, looking down at her, frightening and headstrong. If it hadn't been revealed, you wouldn't be sorry. Follow me when I say something nice. Maria Patron looked back at the young ladies who had come with her with the feeling of grasping the straw for the last time. But the ladies, who had a rough grasp of the context of the story in the conversation, looked at Maria Patron with contempt. Let's go. Lulak said so and left the Galahan clothing store. Maria Patron was forced to follow him in a carriage to the Lombardy mansion. Asterisk 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 when the sky is dark. Seananette stood in front of a house in the capitals. It was a house suitable for the rich commoners rather than the aristocrats. It was only a few hours ago that a woman brought by her father and brother suddenly knelt in front of her. She was from the Schultz estate. In that woman's neck hanging Seananette mother's belongings that she looking for. Vestian Schultz gave it to me. The woman said in a tearful voice when she explained that it was a legacy from Schultz. Even though I knew he had a wife and a family, we continued to meet. I'm really sorry. Twelve Seananette had to hold back the screaming that was about to burst out. How long has it been? It's been seven years, one seven years. At that terrible number, Seananette tightly closed her eyes. And with a stiff face, Seananette knocked on the door of the house that Vestian had prepared for the woman. After a while, the door opened with a little noise. Maria, where have you been? Already dressed in comfortable clothes at home, Vestian casually opened the door and stopped talking. When he found Seananette standing at the front door, his face gradually turned pale. How could you be here? Seananette stared silently at such Vestian. Well, it's. This is my friend's house. Here's the situation, Seananette. Vestian was trying to tell a lie again. And in the end, he gave her a clumsy smile and I said. I know it's a situation that could be misunderstood. Seananette, you trust me, don't you? With the face, she once fell in love with. But rather, Seananette was clear at that moment. This man wasn't the one she promised to be with all her life. Seananette slapped Vestian on the cheek, with all her might. Point three slap. A loud fricative echoed through the quiet residential street. Vestian Schultz. In a cold voice that Vestian had never heard before, Seananette said. There's no house to come back to you now. Turning around, she walked without hesitation to the carriage stand nearby. Without ever looking back. Standing holding his cheek, Vestian, who had just come to his senses, hurried after her. Oh, my God! At a time like this, the 8,000 gold borrowed from the Lombardy Bank was widening Vestian's mind. Point three the moment he was about to follow Seananette out of the alley. Two people were standing in front of Vestian. Gil Lu, Meron. 
you, how can you? They were twins who grew up to be similar in eye level to their father. Point two, get out from the way for a second. Your mother and I have a story to tell. Don't come. Gil Lu said when he placed his hand on Vestian's chest. If you bother my mother anymore, I won't let you go. Mehran gritted his teeth and said. Looking at Vestian with cold warning eyes, the twins turned around when they heard the carriage departed. Point four like Shannonette, the two of them didn't even look back, hurriedly got on the horse. And the horse drove slowly. Dag dag, clap dag. The twin escorted behind a carriage with a golden Lombardy pattern, it went far away. Asterisk 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 Vestian and Shannonette are divorced. However, unlike in previous life, bad people were punished. Point four Vestian and Maria Patron have been jailed for allegedly siphoning off Lombardy's money. Point six even after his sentence ended, the debt of 8,000 gold borrowed from Lombardy Bank and interest would await Vestian. The Schultz were destroyed, of course. My grandfather stepped up to the plate and made it happen. After recovering all the support and investment he had given, nothing remained in the Schultz family. Grandfather then pressured the aristocratic council to remove the name Schultz from the aristocratic register. I heard they gave up their estate and went somewhere to their relatives, but it's none of my business. It was Sean Annette that I was worried about. It's already been a month since that day, and she hasn't been out yet. Point one I've been using twins as an excuse every day, but I haven't seen Sean Annette. Sigh. Just as I was about to open the door to the twins' house, swearing at the Vestian Schultz. Oh, it's Tia. Sean Annette, who just opened the door from inside, smiled brightly at me. Ah. Uh. I was so surprised that I stuttered and asked. Where are you going? I'm on my way to work. Go to work. From today, I'm going to run the Lombardy Mining Company. I'll take over the family I've been leaving behind. Shannonette's face seemed to glow. It wasn't an awkwardly decorated fake smile. Point four Shannonette looked somewhat relaxed. The twins are inside, so play. Yes. Finally, Shannonette, who smiled beautifully and stroked my head, walked down the hall. She looked bigger than ever even though she was walking alone. Point six she kept his back straight and didn't look back at anyone. It was the most Shannonette-like appearance. Chapter 93 You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. My daily routine has been quite simple these days. Coming to Pellet's company three times a week to receive a report from Clarivan was all that was planned. For the rest, I go to the palace to see Perez or hang out with my cousins. I was looking around the square leisurely today and stopped by Pellet's office. Violet, who had been dispatched to help because something busy happened at Gallahan Clothing Store, was also waiting for me in the office after a long time. How did the wheat purchase end in the south? Yes, we had good harvests in the West Suso and the far south of the empire, so we were able to buy them at a good price. I nodded without saying much. It was as I remembered that southern farming was an unprecedented good harvest this year. Clarivan, who saw my reaction not surprising, asked me in a half-hearted tone. Did you know that? What? That the South will have a good harvest this year. You're quick-witted. But I shrugged and put on an expression on my face that I didn't know what he was talking about. I'm not some prophet, how did I know that? But a little while ago, the reaction. That's because I believed from the beginning that Clarivan, Violet, and the competent staff of Pellet Company would do well. Ah. The corners of Clarivan's mouth crept up by my sudden bombshell of praise. He hastily covered his mouth, which has been twitching a few times, but I can see everything with my sharp eyes, so it's no use. Point three after all, Clarivan is very weak at compliments. Point two I let such a Clarivan calm down for a moment and asked Violet. Did you find out what I said about the top of the reds, Violet? Yes, but nothing special came out. I'm sorry. Violet offered a thin report and said with embarrassment. But I shook my head. It's not Violet's fault. This is not the place where the Reds have done so much. The order was made from the beginning with the thought that there would be little expectation. 
you've done a good job knowing this much, Violet. Violet must be weak in praise, too. If you see her neat white face turning red. So I decided to do a little more while I'm at it. You're perfectly good at everything I ask you to do, so I'm a little bored because I don't have anything to do. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'll try harder. Violet turned redder, and Clarivan replied meaningfully as if to determine something. And Clarivan. Yes, Lady Florentia. Lural brought Clarivan's gift on her trip to the east. Send someone to the mansion from the merchant's office and take it. Over the past few months, Lural has been on a long trip to the east, her mother's house, Mrs. Dillard. She bought gifts for me, my father, and Clarivan, but I couldn't give him directly because I had an eye for it. They were half-dot siblings, but they had nothing to do with Clarivan and Dillard. Yes, lady. After pausing for a while, Clarivan nodded in time. He says it doesn't matter at all, but I don't know. Clarivan, whom I've been watching, was a much more caring person for his sister, Lural, than he thought himself. I greeted Clarivan and Violet before returning to the mansion. Asterisk 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 I got off the carriage and went out into the garden and walked a little instead of going straight into the house. After the storm of Vestian's betrayal and Shannonette's divorce passed, the mansion became as peaceful as before. No, it's actually so peaceful that I'm a little bored. Sob. Sob. I heard a child crying on the way into the pine garden. This familiar voice is Craney. Sure enough, Craney was hugging something and crying as he sat by the trees. Why are you crying again? He raises his head buried in his knee at my voice, and Craney's face was puffy. It was covered in tears, a runny nose, and sweaty hair. What's more, he was grinning, burning up his face to the point where he was so upset. Sigh. Tia, Tia. Craney, who found me, ran and hugged me. And he started crying in earnest with more grip. Aw. Oh. His crying sounds are so colorful. I already know from experience that Craney, who cries with a variety of sounds like a crybaby, is not a child who is comforted by soothingly. So I checked the stuff Craney was holding. It's a book. The book I lent you yesterday. But the condition of the book was a little strange. Why is it all torn apart? Looking closely, it wasn't just a modest tear. The bookcase, which was shredded into pieces, even had a lot of black footprints, as if someone had stepped on it. I, I'm sorry. Tia, Dot Craney's cry grew louder as I examined the condition of the book. In fact, I bought it from the beginning with the intention of giving it to Craney. I don't care that the book is ruined because I didn't really care about it. But the same footprint on the bookshelf and Craney's shirt are very eye-dot-catching. I wonder who he's up against, but it's not a trace of someone his age. It was obviously a huge footprint, like a grown adult's foot. Who made this? I asked, pointing to a large footprint. Th, this. Belsack is. Belsack. He's been a little quiet lately. When I scoured Craney's condition, Craney's arm was bruised. Tell me what happened, Craney. Ha. Huh. That's. I, I was reading a book by myself but. But. Uh, Belsack came and asked. What's that book, huh? So. I, I said it's Tia's. It was difficult to understand because of the cries, but this was the whole story described by Craney. You mean, you were reading a book by yourself? Belsack came, and he knew that the book you were reading was mine, and he just tore it apart. Ugh. And you were trying to stop it and this happened. Ugh. Belsack is like an ant's ass. There was an emotional and old feeling. He beat his little cousin because he didn't have anything to bother. No, he was the one who beat me like that in my previous life. Younger Craney can't be okay. Your brother. What did Astalia do? Well, he just by the side. One, he idiot. Your brother's really. 
As I started to heat up because I was frustrated, Craney started sobbing next to me again. I can't believe his brother was just staring at him while this young kid was trying to protect the book. He must have been sad. But I spoke harshly on purpose. Stop. You cried a lot so stopped. Stop crying. Ah. Uh. Craney winced at my words, closing his lower lip. I explained calmly to Craney, who seemed a little calm. Craney, how much do you think this book is? Hmm. I don't know. He hasn't bought anything outside yet, so it's no wonder he doesn't have economic ideas. I bought this book for four silver. How much pocket money do you get every month? One gold. Maybe Laurel and Ronit only gave some of Craney's allowance. Yes, then you can buy this book with your allowance, so you can buy a new book and give it to me. It would be better if you could just say sorry. Ha, but. You don't have to hurt yourself with things you can barely afford. Do you understand me? Yes. It's important to protect what you think is important, but the most important thing is yourself. 3 Whatever he was thinking, his eyes, which are not dry yet, blink a couple of times at me. For Craney who had just turned eight, I gave him a bit of tougher advice. Listen, Craney. You are Lombardy. You're a pretty good Lombardy, too. Lombardy doesn't just sit back and cry when he's upset. We take revenge. Revenge. Yes, revenge. That's the right one, too. I have absolutely no intention of letting Belsack make this child look like this again. Belsack and Estaliu, a backstabbing expert, I believe that I know more about themselves than they do. Of course, even the weak points. But Craney, you're still young, so I'm going to avenge you this time. But you shouldn't just cry like this from now on. Do you understand? Yes, yes. I understand. I patted Craney on the head and turned to the person who had been listening to us. Grandfather. At my call, my grandfather, who was hiding half behind a thick pine tree, walked out point one, huh, how did you know that? My grandfather covered his lips as if he was hiding. But I didn't smile at such a grandfather. My grandfather, noticing that I was furious, scoured Craney's condition and furrowed his eyebrows. I have a favor to ask of you, Grandpa. Tell me. Please allow me to take Craney outside for a while. Hmm. Is that all? Maybe he thought I'll say, please scold Belsack. Grandfather looked surprised. But I didn't mean to say such an easy wish. What Grandfather can do to Belsack is scold him fiercely at best, or ban him from going out for a week. It's not a fair punishment for making Craney like this and daring to tear my book apart. As promised to Craney, I will take care of Belsack myself. Where are you going? Grandfather asked curiously. I'm going to feed him something. I replied, pointing to Craney wiping away tears with the back of his hand. Well, sure. I grabbed Craney's hand right away and got back to the carriage I had just left. The place where I brought Craney was, of course, Caramel Avenue. Here, eat this. I want you to eat a lot and grow up so you can look down at me. Plus I said while pushing milk and chocolate cake in front of Craney. Unlike Belsack, who is short for a man, I know that Craney is the tallest among my cousins. Hee <laughs> hee. Yeah. Craney, who had chocolate on his mouth, smiled with his swollen eyes. Point one, I was handed a napkin to Craney to wipe his mouth, and a little special conversation was heard. What do you mean, you're not going to extend the monthly rent contract? Chapter 94 You are listening at novelfull.audio. Looking toward the sound, I could see Bate, with a rather disconcerted face, talking to someone. Didn't you hear that? I'm asking you to leave the store now. What do you think? The skinny middle dot aged man with a cranky impression seemed quite troublesome to talk to. When I see him keeps picking his ears and clicking his tongue. But at the same time, the man's eyes kept glancing through the shop. His eyes were full of greed. The contract is due next year. 
And at the time of the contract, it will allow me to run the store for the next 10 years without worrying. That's what my father said before he died. I didn't agree with you on that. No matter what. Bate was always smiling softly, but now he's pale. It's only been two years since I opened the store, and I'm barely settling in. Oh, well, it's none of my business. The man who appeared to be the owner of the building had no interest in Bates' circumstances. He seemed to inherit the building because of his father's death, but the new owner was busy looking around the building that suddenly became his. Oh, my father, this nice building at such a ridiculous price. It was a murmur that I didn't know if he was talking to himself or if he wanted anyone else to listen. The more so, the more Bates' handsome face was imbued with despair. But he's not giving up, Bates said, approaching the landlord once again. I'll raise the rent and give it to you. Please reconsider. However, rather than accepting Bates' offer, the landlord was smitten with laughter. And Bates said while flipping up and down. Looks like you're quite young. Life shouldn't be so easy to get there. Ea, easy, easy. Ha. Bates swept up his bangs and swallowed a grin. He had a lot to say, but couldn't bring herself to say it. This bakery is so famous, isn't it? I was wondering how delicious it was. Now that I see it, it was thanks to a good seat. The last thing the new landlord said seemed to be the limit of bait. We're open now, so let's make a timely appointment next time and talk again. I'll visit you. Oh, thank you. The landlord shook one hand in annoyance. Not much longer to say. When you're done with your contract now, be ready to leave. And the man left the store. Sigh. Bates sighed deeply. That's the only way. It's time for, Caramel Avenue, to go viral and recover its investment no wonder the new owner suddenly told him to leave the store. Bate with a frowned brow looked back at me and met my eyes. I said with a smile, not a panic. Here's, two more pieces of the same one. I'll buy a lot. Nodding his head at my words, Bate quickly offered two more pieces of chocolate cake. But a glass of milk was also included. I didn't order this. It's a service. Service. What service if you're about to be kicked out of the store? I looked up, dumbfounded, and Bate said, opening his eyes and scratching the side of his head lightly. It's good to drink a lot of milk while growing up. Oh, yeah. It's been a long time. Being treated like such a proper child. Everyone around me treated me like I was already a half-dot-grown, semi-dot-adult. So did my father and cousins, not to mention Clarivan and Violet, who had me as boss. Because they know very well that I'm not just an ordinary eleven-dot-year-dot-old kid. But that would be the same for bait. Thank you for the drink. I took a sip of the milk as I bowed. Bate looked at me with a slightly pleasing face, but when he met my eyes again, he returned to his expressionless face as if he had never done so. He can't control his facial expression. I drank a couple more sips of milk because I thought I would have a giggle. Then I had a conversation with Craney like that, Bate, who returned to his usual appearance, began working between tables filled with people on the second floor. He stood with his hands in the corner to see if the guests lacked anything, and when he saw an empty glass, he quickly approached and filled it up. Sometimes he looks downstairs at the counter, but most of the time he walks among the guests. It was bait I saw after being a regular at Caramel Avenue for the past few months. For now, bait was a better waiter than anyone else during the store's business hours. During the opening hours of Caramel Avenue. That's why these days the family is in huge debt. Is the third person in the P-Min family cheating on? I heard a rumor from a relative of mine in the West. Looking outside and sipping milk quietly, I can hear the conversation of women sitting in groups on all kinds of topics. It's as if my body is sitting here on Caramel Avenue, but my ears are listening to what happened all over the empire. Then I felt a strong look at me and looked up. A moment ago, Bates stood still in a corner, as if all the scuffles with the landlord were lies. 
He looked like a cat, shining amber bright eyes and standing unnoticed. It's a cat that seems to be doing its job while being sneaky but has sensitive ears. I'm telling you. He can't control his facial expression. I drank a couple more sips of milk because I thought I would have a giggle. Then I had a conversation with Craney like that, Bait, who returned to his usual appearance, began working between tables filled with people on the second floor. He stood with his hands in the corner to see if the guests lacked anything, and when he saw an empty glass, he quickly approached and filled it up. Sometimes he looks downstairs at the counter, but most of the time he walks among the guests. It was bait I saw after being a regular at Caramel Avenue for the past few months. For now, Bate was a better waiter than anyone else during the store's business hours. During the opening hours of Caramel Avenue. That's why these days the family is in huge debt. Is the third person in the P. Min family cheating on? I heard a rumor from a relative of mine in the West. Looking outside and sipping milk quietly, I can hear the conversation of women sitting in groups on all kinds of topics. It's as if my body is sitting here on Caramel Avenue, but my ears are listening to what happened all over the empire. Then I felt a strong look at me and looked up. A moment ago, Bates stood still in a corner, as if all the scuffles with the landlord were lies. He looked like a cat, shining amber bright eyes and standing unnoticed. It's a cat that seems to be doing its job while being sneaky but has sensitive ears. I'm telling you. He can't control his facial expression. Asterisk 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 the conference hall where the members of the aristocracy gathered was hot. The reason is, issues that can be raised sharply by sitting opposite each other and divided into two camps are presented as the topic of the meeting. Where there is a drought, it is natural to temporarily lower tax rates to ease the burden on the empire. Is that the burden of the capital's people? It's a burden to the eastern aristocrats. The two nobles, who were at the forefront of each group, stood up against each other by putting blood on their necks. The east was already tax.exempted last year's drought. It's greed to do so again this year, greed. There's been a worse drought than last year, so what? Eastern aristocrats will either dispose of their private property or get money. After such a long flight, this time, the nobles, who were a little older than the nobles who forefront the war, came forward. The country's finances are in a mess because of the tax cuts in the East. I don't think you don't know that either. Our coffers are indeed down a little, but not really. Not enough to squeeze out the Eastern blood. But when the eastern nobles have fallen under the guise of drought, the rest of the country is suffering a great deal of damage. This is east selfishness, this selfishness. Lombardy and Anginas remain silent when each of them fighting with a loud voice. Lord of Anginas was listening to his aides who constantly whispering, and Lulac Lombardy was easygoing as if he were sitting alone in another world. Point two, they were fighting fiercely as if national security was at stake right away, but in reality, it was not so serious. There is a drought in the East, so will they be exempt from their taxes this year or not? That was all. In fact, only a few members of the aristocracy sitting here were from the East. There was only one reason why everyone was fighting so hard over other people's business. Pride. This was a battle of pride for the nobles, led by Lombardy and Anginas. When such a heated war of words reached a lull, Lord of Angina spoke. If we have to exempt eastern taxes no matter what, the levy on families who oppose it here should not be raised at all. What kind of absurdity is that? Of course, if the tax on one side decreases, the burden on the other side will increase. The calm offensive was poured explosively on the Lord of Anginas. But Anginas was silently receiving the grudges. If the embers seem extinguished, they talk again and continue the atmosphere. We must continue to stall on this agenda, Ferdick pulled out a handkerchief and wiped his sweat. He must ensure that the next agenda is moved to the next meeting. The aristocracy followed the majority rule. However, the number of nobles in the Angina side present today was a bit small. If they move on to the next agenda in this state, Anginas were sure to lose a lot of money. 
But at that moment, the eyes of Ferdic Anginas and Lulak Lombardy met. Whoops. Lord of Anginas tried to put a handkerchief in his arms with a calm face, but it was a pity. It was because Lulak Lombardy, who sat across from the large conference hall, was seen raising the corners of his mouth strangely. Stop stop, the noisy market dot like hall was quickly silenced by Lulak Lombardy's voice. The same was true of the Anginas camp, which stopped speaking. Lulak Lombardy had such a presence. What's the use of continuing our discourse here? The nobles, who were slow and reluctant to admit it, were becoming calm little by little, excited by the dignified voices. You can't do this. Angela said something hastily. What a contempt for our entire aristocracy. Apologize. He said something out of the blue because he spoke hastily. Those who sided with Anginas also flinched for a moment and looked back at Ferdic. His face turned red, but Ferdic Anginas stared at Lolak, pretending not to know and very angry. I mean, let's hear the emperor's opinion. After all the taxes that we talk about here, who pays a lot and who pays less, all of them, belong to your majesty. There was nothing to refute. There was an atmosphere of nodding and acceptance. Looking back at the crowd, Lulak Lombardy said softly. Then why don't we move on to the next agenda? Ferdic and Genus bowed his head. No matter how hard he tried, he was no match for Lulak Lombardy. It felt like he was blocked by a huge wall. After the meeting, Ferdic and Gina's steps toward the Empress Palace were heavy. In the end, they were completely defeated by Lulak Lombardy, plus when he opened the door of the Empress Palace, the sound of breaking things from afar was already loud. One of the Empress made dot in dot honor had already told what had happened at the conference hall. Lord of Anginas, who closed his eyes tightly, arrived in the drawing dot room and opened the door. Eddie E. D. Clang. As soon as the door opened, a vase flew and broke into pieces at the feet. Chapter 95 You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Ha! Enraged to the point where her finely combed hair fell, the Empress broke one last frame and sat down on the sofa. The opposite of a frantic Empress, Astana, who was leisurely drinking tea, smiled at the Lord of Anginas. My grandfather is here, isn't he? Your, Your Highness. Astana is growing day by day reached her sixteenth birthday soon. Was he here? Lord of Anginas averted his gaze. He knew Astana was a loner, but that was a little too much. It was as if the blood of Emperor Jovans had not been mixed at all, it was like seeing Rabini as a child. Point two, I don't trust my incompetent grandfather, so what can I do? Even that personality. I'm sorry. Ferdic and Ginas sighed and bowed his head once again. Father. The Empress, who was leaning on the armrest of the sofa who was tired, called his father. Yes, Empress. Another diamond vein was found in the Lyra mine. Is that so? But even before Ferdic and Ginas's words were finished, the Empress rose from her seat. Is that so? The Empress' blue eyes stared intently with a blue glint. That's what you are going to say. Clang. Clang. Just in time, the Empress picking up the teacup Astana had put down, threw it into the wall behind the Lord of Anginas. If you'd done what I told you to do. The mine. The diamond. It was all our Anginas's. When Pellet, who stole the Lyra coal mine, made money from diamonds, the Empress's hatred and jealousy were getting worse. At tea parties and banquets hosted by the Empress, accessories made of diamonds were banned. The Empress screamed horribly point one her hand holding the head trembled. To prevent herself from hitting his subordinate. Get out. Get out. The Empress pointed angrily at the door. Ferdic and Genus had no choice but to leave the Empress Palace as ordered. There was no resentment about being treated like this by his daughter. The father. Daughter relationship had long since disappeared. And Gina's was nothing more, nothing less, than a foundation force to solidify the Empress's power. Point one, whoa. Astana, who breathed a heavy sigh, approached behind Lord of Anginas's back. 
My maternal grandfather. Yes, your highness. I'm sorry to show you my shame a little while ago. Oh, that's fine. What happened to what I asked you to do before? If it was before. A few weeks ago, Astana had secretly asked for favors. He said he wanted private land in an area outside the capitals. However, under the imperial law, a prince cannot have a private property while living in the palace. It was the same reason they didn't have knights or an army. However, Astana, who has been trying to make mine, asked his maternal grandfather, Lord of Anginas, to buy land under borrowed names. On the day he was arrested, he was held in treason and beheaded, but Ferdic Anginas attempted to grant the request. I'm talking to the lord of the area you mentioned, but I think it's going to be a little difficult. He grew up so close to the Lombardy family. Why don't you choose a different area? What, you can't do that much? Astana said with a frown. Didn't I explain it to you then? The land is a good place to hunt. If you need a good hunting ground, I'll look for other more suitable lands. I want that land. But, your highness. How dare you argue with me, a prince? It was Astana's favorite word to use whenever he was at a disadvantage since he learned to speak. Oh, and get me a diamond brooch. What? But the Empress. My mother doesn't like it, so do I have to hate it. Lord of Anginas opened his eyes wide with surprise. Astana never did what the Empress told him not to do. By the way. I'm not a puppet who only does what my mother tells me to do. Astana, who muttered so gruffly, said as he stared at the Lord of Anginas for the last time. The next time you come to the palace, you have to bring the hunting land documents and brooches. Then Astana glanced at the parlor where the Empress was and went to his palace. Watching the scene, a bad feeling ran through the Lord of Anginas's spine. That Astana has reached puberty and the rebellious period has begun. It was such a premonition that something out of control would happen if he began to rebel against the Empress. Asterisk 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 Bate sat alone in an empty caramel avenue waiting for the landlord after business hours. The landlord, who had suddenly wanted to end the contract, was silent on Bate's proposal to meet and talk. Then finally, this morning he got a reply. It was a call to meet after business hours. Caramel Avenue was supposed to get busier after business hours, but it couldn't be helped. Anyway, he had to meet the landlord and solve the contract problem. It's almost time for an appointment. Bates said, looking at the door where there was no sign yet. Personal information about the new landlord was floating in his head. Rochelle Cox. 35 years old. Single. He was disowned at the age of 22 and lived away from the capitals, but returned after hearing his father's death. It's been a pretty normal history so far. Although it was a little unique, people usually get married around the age of 20 in the empire, at 35 years old he has never even been married. Based on the man's personality, it could be seen why he couldn't find any woman to marry. In addition, the information that Bate found was more spectacular. Gambling debt is around 300 gold. He was a typical wanker of a noble family. Any information that was disowned 13 years ago was also a gambling issue. And that was not the end. A swindler who worked under the alias Jeff Ritchie in the North. Still on the wanted list. How dare he cheat with an alias. Thought it was bad. When he came to the store the other day. There was a harsh way of speaking and behaving as a noble. Probably he got disowned by his family and went around doing a lot of bad things. But the most important thing was the last part. Still on the wanted list. The nobles who were tricked by him in the north must have gritted their teeth. Maybe he knows that best. Bate decides to use it as a threat card. I'm sorry, my lord. Recalling the deceased former building owner, Bate has a bit of guilt. Even more so because he was the one who gave Bate a lot of convenience in many ways with a very good impression. But he couldn't lose this store. Even if there was a limit to using the information as a weapon, it had to be protected. Rattle. 
Bait rose from his seat at the bell sound. Welcome. I've been waiting. Hello. Different from the murky voice of the new landlord. It was a clear and cheerful voice. Wow, it feels different at night. Mr. Bate is even cooler. The girl who smiled had a very familiar face. Bate murmured the girl's name unconsciously. Florentia. Lombardy. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, I became the owner of this building as of today. I kindly explained to Bate, who had a blank face. Young miss, you're. I mean, Lady Lombardy became the owner of this building. Yes. I bought this building. Honestly, considering the price, it wasn't a smart purchase. Frankly, this amount of consumption is not noticeable thanks to the diamond business. Besides, it's a great investment in the future. The last time I saw you, you looked troubled. So I looked into it. The person I saw last time and the situation of Caramel Avenue. You mean you did a background check? This isn't even a background check that I don't want the shop I frequented to disappear. I told you before. This place feels like my hideout. Or a place to be my hideout in the future. Who dot who, so I bought it from him, this building. Now I'm the owner of the building. Wow, I can't believe I'm saying this point when I'm the owner of the building. It's thrilling. It's the best. But the man said he was going to open a dessert shop in this place, right? Bates' shoulders trembled slightly. Maybe he didn't know that until now. He has no conscience. I think he'll pretend to be Caramel Avenue and keep trying to do business. Do you know how much I paid for this building? I asked secretly. Well. I spread out four fingers. I gave him 400 gold. The amount was several times higher than the market price. Why did you buy this building? I just told you. I didn't want my regular store to disappear. That can't be true. People like you simply for that reason. What kind of person am I? Bait, who accidentally spilled his words, made a sad face but it was too late. As expected, you've done some research on me. I mean. Lady Lombardy. You must have gathered information about me. When I put the word information in my mouth, Bates' eyes grew fierce. He's not the sweet manager of Caramel Avenue, I know, but now he feels better because I feel like I've seen a little of Bates' real self. It's okay. I know a little bit about Bates, too. I pulled up my hair and smiled at Bates, who seemed to be wary of me. It's quite different from what I've encountered in my previous life. At that time, I, who was really proud of being able to read people, was a hard and skilled person that I couldn't even see that through. Caramel Avenue originally disappeared this year, but after 10 years, it suddenly reappears here, plus and around that time, I also visited this store as a customer. To confess. I said, looking at the amber eyes that were watching me. I know this, Caramel Avenue isn't just a dessert shop. An information guild that secretly buys and sells information, Caramel Avenue. And the guild leader who leads the guild. That was Bates' hidden identity. Chapter 96 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Watching Bait right now reminded me of my previous life. I also bought information from, Caramel Avenue. It was to find out about Perez. But because this is a secret place and only known by acquaintances, so I didn't know much about bait. What I said a little while ago, I know something, was half a true. I really don't know anything except that bait runs an information store. The same was true of this building. I don't know why he came back ten years later and reopened the same store again. L.C. I only assume that this place means a lot to bait. And now, I can see from Bates' reaction, which is very shaky, that my guess was right. I don't know what you're talking about. Bates seemed intent on playing dumb to the end. I said with a shrug. You're shyer than I thought. It's not, it. Bates, who will deny, stop talking. 
he is certainly much softer than the bait that I remember. Calm and shady face. And one thought crossed my mind. How much information power does bait have now? Information that accumulates over time. Besides, Caramel Avenue is just getting settled. I want to test his current abilities. Isn't the monthly rent too much to run a shop? In my words, Bate looked at me as if it didn't matter. He still seems to be wary of me. Then how about this? Do some serious investigation on me. And if I like the result, I'll allow you to rent one year for free. One year. Bates' eyes shook as if he was calculating in his head. What do you think? Isn't that a pretty good offer? It would be tempting. You can save money for a year. But Bates shook his head slightly. Investigation. I'm just a dessert shop owner, and I said I didn't know anything. Oh, that's what you're going to do? Yes, of course. I got up as if I had no other business. That's too bad, it would have been an opportunity to save a lot of money for a year. Ugh, if you change your mind and willing to accept my offer, I'll see you in a week at this time. I just said that and left the store. It was obvious what Bates' face would be after left alone. I giggled onto the carriage waiting outside. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, Tia, are you ready? Let's go. Lural tightened her shoelaces one last time and the twins waited outside. If you keep making noise, I won't go. Oh, okay. Ha. Huh. My voice quickly turns sullen when I get annoyed. Lural, who was listening to the twins' war of words, smiled softly. The three of you are on good terms. Lural. Yes, lady. Are you kidding me? No, I really mean it. I saw Lural's brothers treat you well. Born as the youngest of three siblings with a huge age difference, Lural grew up with love. She had seen the Dillards gathered in one place, full of friendly laughter and constantly looking at the perfect family. Maybe that's why Clarivan's presence is a bigger flaw. I opened the door and went outside. The waiting twins rose from their seats with a big smile. Oh, so cute. I want to bite you because you're so cute. The twins stamping their feet at me. You seem cuter all of a sudden these days. Stop being pretty. What's wrong with them? But Lural joined in. She wrapped her hands around her cheeks and shook her head and said. I'm telling you, lady, you're so much cuter. Is that so? I checked the mirror because I thought it was true. After all, Lural said it. To be weird. There's not much difference in my eyes. And the eyes of the three people looking through the mirror are very burdensome. What are you doing? Aren't you going? Then, the twins started to move quickly. Let's go. Let's go. I'm sure Teal love it, too. Gilu and Mehran took the lead in hopping across the wide meadows outside Lombardy. Of course, I didn't go just to look at the ground. Wow, the stable is huge. There was admiration for the several stables where dozens of horses lived. It's a place where the nobles in the capital keep their horses. Everyone comes, ride horses, or compete. Once they were eleven years old, these two always came and went here every day. Just looking at the vast meadows feels refreshing to my heart. Tia doesn't know how to ride a horse yet. Let's ride together. Gilu said, reaching out to me. No, I drive safer than Gilu. Ride with me. This time Mehran stepped in and said. You drive a horse safely. Liar. I'm much better than you. That's not wrong, is it? They growl again to fight. I looked at the two with pathetic eyes and said, holding Lural's hand. I'm riding with Lural. Lural is also a good rider. No, at least it's better than those two troublemakers. Ha! Huh. The twins shrugged their shoulders at my decision but I ignored it. I won't change it. So give up. My choice was right. Lural was a stable and fast driver, 
and the experience of riding a horse together was thrilling. Wow! It was good for the wind to hit the face, and it was good to run together while feeling the powerful movement of the horse. And the strong smell of grass from the meadow lingers in my mind more intensely than anything else. To the point where I want to learn how to ride a horse. What do you think? It's fun, isn't it? Meron turned and asked me. Yes, it's good. As expected. I knew Tia would like it. Shall we run one more time? Gil-Lu said, tapping the excited horse in the neck. Hmm. One more time. It was fun but I don't feel like it. Riding an unfamiliar horse made my back, legs, and hips stiff and sore. Actually this was something I was afraid of, but riding the horse turned out to be fun. No. Lural said firmly. It's your first time, so don't overdo it. That's it for today and come back next time. Whoa, is that so? Well, Tia can't be sick. The twins nodded and quickly understood. Then we'll put the horse back in the stable. Wait here for a second. Let's go see the autumn leaves over there when we get back. Yes, go ahead. I got off the horse and waved at the two men walking by the reins. Lady, I'm in the toilet for a second. Lural whispered quietly. Then I'll go see Bailey and Blanc. Bailey and Blanc were mother horses and baby horses that my father bought for my eighth birthday. It was originally in a stable at the mansion, but as Blanc grew bigger and bigger, it was moved here not long ago. I was a little disappointed because I couldn't see them often, but I think it was a good choice. They can run around here to the heart's content. There must be Vipash too, which Perez gave me as a gift. I wonder if all the family members are together. I began to walk in search of the stables where my horses were. Somewhere around here. If I can't find it, I can ask someone. I took it easy and looked around the stable. I walked from stable to stable, looking at the horses looking at me with curious eyes. Then, I met a cat family who was living in a stable and played for a while. I was walking again. And suddenly I realized. Where am I? I really went to a faraway place. It was still near the stable. But it was not clear exactly how many stables this was. Well, do you guys know where we are? I asked the horses that were showing their faces, but they only blinked mildly, and there was no way the answer would come. Let's go first. I just took a random walk to what appears to be where I first started. Then, just in time, a group of children coming out of the nearby stable called me. There, you. There are five or six children who seem to have money in their families. Ages ranged from mine to the twins. Among them, the one who spoke to N.E. was a child who walk in front of them. He's young, and he's acting like a boss, so he's maybe a high-dot-ranking kid. I think I've seen you somewhere. Who are you? Okay. Of course, children can speak informally for the first time. But even so, he is too short-dot-spoken. Especially, I feel bad about him looking up and down at me. Who are you, then? What? Ha! When I belittled him, the boy with the bangs swept as if he was dumbfounded smiled. You don't even know who I am. It's obvious you've never even heard my name. Well, that was a reasonable deduction. Usually, high dot ranking nobles know each other well because they play and hang out with each other since they were young. However, I grew up with a rather unique father for a nobleman. I'm Case Anginas too it's Anginas again. At the same time, Anginas's family tree spread out in my head. Case Anginas was the grandson of Durak Top's owner. In other words, it meant that he was not the direct line of the householder, but the sideline, plus however, it seems that Anginas' prestige is high these days, as it is even used and carried around like that. Then I heard a familiar voice and turned around. Here you are. Lural was running towards me. Chapter 97 You are listening at novelfull.audio
After Luro went to the bathroom for a while, she wandered around the stables looking for Florentia, she was relieved to find her. She was very surprised that some strange people were with her. But the atmosphere between Florentia who seemed to be just chatting with a group of young nobles was extraordinary. Luro, who accidentally saw Florentia's face, was surprised. It was because she saw Florentia's smile when Florentia didn't like something. What's wrong? Luro asked carefully. No, these people here ask me who I am. Yes. But why? She's so angry. Luro gulped. And Florentia comes up with the answer. And you don't even know who I am. It's obvious you've never even heard my name. That he said. Uh, how could he be so rude? Lural felt sorry for the boy standing with his folded arms and a cheeky expression. The cutest, smartest, prettiest girl in the world she served hates the kind of people who despise others just because of their dignity or family status. And even more, if they're rude to others. Perhaps due to her cousin's influence, Lural was only predicting cautiously. I'm a member of the Anginas family. Case Anginas. Oh. Lural groaned sadly. This wasn't a situation Lural could interrupt if he was from Anginas. Lural stepped back halfway, giving up. Good morning, Lady Dillard. A boy staring at Florentia with a frown a little while ago greeted Lural in a fairly polite way. Lural thought she had seen him a few times on the road. Is this person a guest of Lady Dillard? Guest. Lural hesitated for a moment because she didn't know how to answer. The club membership here is strict. It's right to enter here as a guest once. However, all of this land was Lombardy's, with a stable built for the central aristocrats. But then Florentia took the lead. My family is close to Dillard. Lural looked awkwardly at Florentia, but she just grinned. It wasn't a lie that Lombardy was close to Dillard. Well, I don't like the fact that an unidentified person is walking around here. Furthermore, this condescending attitude as if this stable belonged to him was starting to irritate Lural's eyes. Then he told Tia as if he was heartened. I'll give you a chance to make up for your rude mistake a moment ago. We're on our way, so I'll let you join our tea party. Have a tea with you. Ah, you don't have to be so grateful. We are all very generous people. Why? Florentia tilted her head and asked as if she didn't understand. You said something about someone with an unknown identity like me. Then why are you suddenly inviting me to a tea party? Well, that's. Lural, watching the bewildered case and genus. He thought for a moment with a stiff neck and red ears, he was unable to answer Florentia's questions. He seemed to be trying to talk to Florentia, bragging about her family's strength just because of her small appearance. It seemed like it was a mistake made by him who didn't know her name. It was then. What? Why is everyone here? What are you doing here? Gil Lu and Mehran stepped closer. Lo, Lombardy twins. Case and Gina's neck, which had been tense just a moment ago, shrank. They are objects that are feared and difficult by all because of their personalities, outspoken words and actions, and the unstoppable power of the Lombardy direct lineage. Also, physical conditions such as height and size are superior, which makes them feel overwhelmed. Why are they coming this way? Someone in the crowd murmured quietly. To be honest, Lombardy's twins were scary. They don't pretend as Case and Genus does, they actually own this stable. Gilu, Mehran. And when the group saw the girl calling the twins friendly, they almost fell back in amazement. They wanted me to join the tea party. Florentia said, pointing her finger at the group. In an instant, the twins' impression turned bad. The group looked at them with frowns and doubts. What, Anginas is coward. Did you guys bother Tia for tea? Even a gangster I met in a back alley wouldn't be this scary. The group, who used to brag as if this was their own, quickly became Anginas's coward, but there was no one denying it. Well, that's. 
Cass and Ginas couldn't even speak because he was afraid of the twins. But then Florentia spoke in a calm voice. You too, you can't speak so rudely. You have to be polite. Polite. Those two. The twins, called Lombardy's miscreants, were far from polite. But a miracle happened. The snarling twins suddenly smiled like obedient puppies. All right, Tia. The twins, who answered obediently, asked with a slight smile. Did you ask our Tia for tea? It was obviously a much more polite word. But why is it even scarier? Point three, well, it's not us. Someone sneaked a look at Kaysangina's and said in a trembling voice. Dot is it you? Oh. Kaysangina's shuddered as if he were going to sink. Why? Gilu asked, pulling his face close. Well, I've never seen him before. Ha. Huh. Mehran came close as well with a strange nasal voice. And whispered in a low voice. You're a coward, but you have an eye for things, and Gina's. The eyes below the long eyelashes were cold. Gil Lu said, fiddling with a sword handle around his waist. How dare you look over my sister? Is it your wish to have a short life, nine, he? Case and Gina's shrank in fear. Stop it, you too. I'm tired. Florentia only said a word in a deep voice as if she had lost interest. In no time, the twins' sharpness disappeared, and there were only two smiling face left looking at Florentia. You are tired, Tia. Let's go somewhere warm. Florentia and Lural took the lead first, followed by twins. The group of young nobles who were left behind didn't seem to care whether they fainted or not as their legs were loosened. Florentia mumbled a little on the way to the sunny place the twins had seen. It's all so uncomfortable that people don't recognize me. Should I start my debutante now? Asterisk asterisk asterisk, Caramel Avenue, became quiet after the sales times. Tali, the patissier, smiled and greeted Bate, who had just sat with her buttocks in the office set up inside the kitchen. Good job today, Bate. Ah, uh, Uncle Two. Great job. But Bate reached for the dizzyingly coated papers on the desk. You've been working all day along. Take it easy now, Bate. Tolly felt sorry for Bate. At the age when he should enjoy life, it was hard to watch him being immersed in his work, except for sleeping time. In particular, he hasn't seen Bate rest since he started preparing for the information business. I will look at a few more papers. It's okay. Go ahead, uncle. Well, yeah. I left a few pieces of apple pie on the shelf. Eat when you're hungry. Tolly looked at Bate with worried eyes till the end and patted him on the shoulder and said. Yes, sir. Bate, who was left alone after work by Tolly wearing glasses he had left off and picked up the papers. In the dim light, the rimless glasses glowed yellow. Hmm. You want me to investigate you in earnest. That voice, who scratched his pride, still sounded clear in his ears. You didn't think I would find out. Acquiring and gathering information was Bates' specialty. He also has a keen eye for sorting out obscure information from rumors. It had been a long time since the little Lombardy's girl, who started in and out of stores a few months ago, had been on Bates' sensitive list. As if to show herself, she ordered cakes from here to there every time she came. Bate couldn't help but care when she visited Clarivan Pellet from the Rising Pellet Company. In addition, she is the only child of the famous Galahan Lombardy and the favorite granddaughter of Lolac Lombardy. That far, she was special in many ways, but Bate could instinctively feel that there was something more special about Florentia Lombardy. I'll scratch you to the bottom. Bate murmured like that and began to bury himself in the mountains of papers. It seemed like dots and dots were completely irrelevant to him, he kept sorting out pieces of the puzzle to write in them. Then, a big picture is drawn that no one knew. The night went by and the moon, which had risen high in the sky, tilted. In the end, it was only when the eastern sky began to brighten that Bate was able to stop working. 
tucked the frameless glasses rolled on the table, but Bate didn't care. Rubbing his face with his big hands, he sighed deeply. And covered his mouth. A scream that was about to explode was trapped inside it. It was clear that the scattered codes were talking one after another. The Florentia Lombardy was a much bigger picture than Bait had ever imagined. Bait murmured like a moan. Who the hell are you? Chapter 98 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Today was an appointment with Bait. It was very late in the afternoon when I left Lombardy's mansion and had arrived in front of Caramel Avenue when the sky was dark. Shops, which many people visit all day, have been closed and silent without anyone. Jingle. I opened the door and the bell rang at the empty shop. As I entered the dark shop, Bait came out from the back of the kitchen. Hello, Bait. But there is no greeting. Bait just pulled my chair with a stiff face. Other nobles would feel pretty bad, but I sat there with a shrug. By the way, Bait was empty. Handed. You don't have any paperwork or anything. I was just asking out of curiosity. Bait said, frowned as if his pride was quite hurt. I have the information in my head. Well, that's not what I meant. You're so mean. However, I prefer to see it. I like the way Bait looks without being servile, even though he has researched about me and found out quite a lot. Let's get started, shall we? I clapped my hands once and said, Whoa. Bait sighed briefly and looked straight at me. Florentia Lombardy. Eleven years old now. Galahan Lombardy's only daughter, Lulac Lombardy's third sons. There was a dull voice that seemed to read information about simple subject of investigation that wasn't me, right in front of me. Like the day I asked for information about Perez. She doesn't have any special history as an infant except that her mother was a wanderer who came into Lombardy one day. Rather, she belongs to the timid side, unlike other Lombardy bloodlines, but. Bates' amber eyes staring directly at me seemed to flash at the moment. Before and after her eighth birthday, she began to gain a reputation as Lombardy's gifted child. Starting to stand out among the three successors and receiving personal guidance from education officer Clarivan Pellet. Hmm. That's right. To be honest, so far it's not that surprising. This kind of information is something that anyone can say by bribe Lombardy employees a little bit. Of course, it won't be easy because people who work in Lombardy tend to have a heavy mouth. One, by the way, my blunt attitude seems to have provoked bait. And since then, Florentia Lombardy and the surroundings began to change dramatically. Not only did she start winning Lord Lulac's heart, but her father Galahan Lombardy's move is completely different from before. Bates' voice became even lower. Galahan Lombardy, who has lived almost in seclusion for 30 years, suddenly successfully leads the Coroy Cotton business, a huge joint venture between Lombardy and Anginas. Then, a few months later, he created a new type of clothing business called Ready. Wear, and so far, Galahan Clothing Store has been successful in everything that has never been done before. This is where you are starting suspicious. Is that all? So what do you think, Bait? Dot it sounds crazy. Bait bit his teeth once and replied. I think it's all the results of Lady Florentia Lombardy's involvement. I asked, squeezing a smile between my lips. Isn't that too much of a leap? I'm just an eleven-year-old kid. I mean, that's why I'm saying it's crazy. Bates said in a row. But all the information is pointing there. It's just that my dad could be a very smart guy, right? He just hasn't had a chance. No. Bates shook his head quite firmly. If it was for the Coroy cotton business and the start of a ready dot to dot wear business, I would have thought so. But since then, the steps that Galahan has taken are clearly beyond the capacity of Galahan Lombardy. For example, women's clothing followed by men's and children's clothing. Recently, he introduced the concept of limited edition to build a premium line. Galahan Lombardy would have worked hard to strengthen the inner circle of the ready.to. 
Where business? Someone with common sense doesn't seem to think about it. So you're saying I'm being unreasonable? It's only people who have a very good sense, or who can read the whole flow, that take such risks and move boldly. I decided to poke bait a little. But there was Clarivan, doesn't he? Bate nodded at my words. Yes, but it doesn't explain the Esther ointment that shook the medical community a few years ago, to say that it's the work of Clarivan Pellet. I didn't even know that. I patted my tongue, avoiding Bates' gaze. So what's Bates' conclusion? I think Lady Florentia Lombardy has played a shadow role in several ways, including clothing stores supervised by Clarivan Pellet. You have extraordinary potential. Oh, you think Clarivan leads me? In fact, considering my age, it is right to think so. Possibilities. I reflect on what Bates said. Of course, it was a nice thing to hear. But it also meant the future was uncertain. And Bate is not a person who can trust and entrust the information guild he was trying to create for such an unspecified future possibility. I made a decision and said. I think I won this bet. What? Bait asked again with a dumb face. He probably thought he'd won because he'd done a lot of research on me. If you're trying to force yourself out of pride. No, it's not forced, but unfortunately, there was a limit to Bates' investigation. Sigh, what the hell is going on? That's the breaking point. Bait grumbled, still completely unaware of facial control. Wait a minute. I got up from my seat, opened the store door, and called someone who was waiting nearby. Just in case, I told him the time and place of the appointment today and asked him to wait in the carriage. I'm glad he did. Sir. Clarivan. At my call, Clarivan came right into the store. Did you call, Lady Florentia? Bate does not like excessive politeness for teachers to treat their students. I thought I could convince Bate if I had you here. Just a moment ago, you told me that I were supervised by Sir Clarivan. Yes, I did. Bate still looked as if he didn't know what was wrong. I grabbed the skirt and greeted politely. This time, I'll introduce myself properly. I'm Florentia Lombardi, the real owner of Pellet Company. Yes. Bate, who had a dumb face, scratched his ear with his fingers. Then he looked at Clarivan with eyes demanding clarification. Lady Florentia is right. R, are you serious, then? Clarivan nodded his head. Ha, but the name Pellet Company. It's just a name. Clarivan replied coolly. But she's only eleven years old. Amazing, isn't it? Well, then, indeed, the Lombardy spirit. Lombardy's light and hope. Ha, ha, ha. Bait laughed desperately as if he had gone mad. Point one, he took turns looking at me, and Clarivan, who was standing beside me. And then he laughed again. Then ready dot to dot where? To my surprise, it was my father's idea. But yours intervention. There was. Bait was right about that. Oh, as expected. Bait seemed to need some time alone. He thought about something with his chin on his hand and murmured to himself. I see, then it all makes sense. I didn't know what was going on. Then he raised his head and asked. Then the diamond mine. What happened to Lombardy and Angina's auction? Were you lucky? If you think about how many golds the Pellet Company won the bid, you'll get the answer. Angina's wrote 2,000 gold and lost the mine to us who wrote 2050 gold. Ah. Bate curled up as if he was tearing his head apart. I approached Bate and patted him on the shoulder. It hasn't been that long since you entered the information business. I think that's a pretty good ability. How did you know that I started the information business? Bate freaked out, breathing in vain. Well, how did I know Anginas would write 2,000 gold? Ah. Bate put on an angry face. It seems annoying for him that I know more things than he does and sees through him more accurately. I once again made an offer to Bate that he cannot refuse. 
then let's make another bet. Bait gritted his teeth and asked. What is it this time? What was the hottest topic at the recent aristocratic conference? It was a remedy for the eastern drought. The decision fell to the emperor. As expected, you knew. The internal affairs of the aristocracy would be very difficult to obtain. What decision does Bait think the emperor will make? I think this year will be difficult because they already got last year's tax exemption. It will be a big blow for the treasury. Then I'll bet against your. I'll bet on the store's rent for five years. Five, five years worth. Bait gulped down his mouth. So if I lose, what does Lady Florentia get? If I win. I snapped as if I was putting the bait on a calm surface. Give me the priority of information. The first right to access the information that bait will be collecting in the future. Bait was silent for a while. I held my breath together. And finally, bait nodded. Let's do it, that bet. Asterisk 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 wow, war. In the quiet mansion, a coachman can be heard calming the horse. Lying under the deliberately opened window, I was dazed and opened my eyes. He's back. Belsack, who had been on a hunting trip with Astana for more than a week, is finally back. Point seven underscore 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 glossary. 1. I be a Its Korean idiom literally, the mouth, or lips, is heavy slash heavy dot mouthed. It means someone who can really keep other people's secrets. From. I be. Mouth, I. Consonant plus, subject marker, mujiabda. Heavy. Chapter 99 You are listening at NovelFull.audio I was waited a little longer and walked out leisurely. The sunset was slowly setting and painting the sky red. It was quiet and silence outside after finishing unloading the luggage. I saw flocks of birds flying in droves as I walked while looking up at the sky with my hands behind my back like old man out for a walk. Birds are migrating. Birds that cross the continent every year visit Lombardy's mansion to rest their tired bodies throughout the day. It was because there were few people and many trees in the mansion area. You guys are going to rest in the mansion today, right? Watching the birds lurking all over the trees in the mansion, I checked the contents of the bag in my hand. Dot what I specially prepared for today is well contained. Then all are set. I've confirmed that Belsack has unloaded all the luggage he brought, and the time has come. I headed for the stable with a delightful heart. It was Belsack's habit to stop by the stable to check the condition of his beloved horse after hunting. I waited on the street that Belsack frequently used to go to the stable. There were a lot of trees and no one nearby. This is the right path. Not long after, Belsack began to be seen. But he was not alone. Hold it properly. It's dragging on the floor. Ha! Huh. Craney who walking beside Belsack, whimpering with something heavy. Point one looking closely, it was a horse saddle. It was also very heavy because it was made of leather. It, it's heavy. It's a ridiculous weight for a still young Craney. By the way. Bam! Belsack hit Craney's little head and said threateningly. Do you want to be beaten more? Oh, no. Itchem. Craney burst into tears. And my patience is running out too. Craney. I said towards the two people. Throw away what you're holding and come here. T, Tia. Craney, who opened his eyes wide in surprise, wiped away his tears with his sleeve. What the hell are you? Belsack crumpled his face at me. I don't care. I just looked at Craney. Ooh, wound. Craney pursed his lower lip to muster up the courage and tossed the saddle in front of Belsack. 
Hey, you're crazy. Belsack was furious, but Craney already running away. Belsack, how much have you been bothering Craney? From what I saw earlier, I had a strong premonition that what I knew would be the tip of the iceberg. One, Belsack smirked and laughed at me. Why? Do you want to do it instead of him? Ha, this pair of nerds. He's been quiet lately, so I think he's matured a bit. As expected, Belsack has not changed. The bully seemed to just change from me to Craney. Yeah, half blood. Then you bring it. Belsack told me, kicking the saddle. Ha, huh, Belsack. Don't you have a brain? What, what? I've made it clear. Don't call me half bluff. You idiot. You, you freak girl. When he grew up, Belsack raised his fist threateningly, citing his physical superiority. I rather said, raising my neck stiffly. Hit me, if you can. Ick. You can't hit me, because if you hit me, you'll be punished. Grandpa will be the first to punish you. And my father is no longer a person who lives with patience. Belsack, who snorted at my words, smiled suspiciously. Really? But there's no grandfather or your father here. If I swing my fist a few times, you'll be so screwed that you can't even run and tell them. Belsaka's eyes glistened. I remembered those I exactly. Those are the same words that laughed happily in my previous life, when I cried out in pain and fear. As expected, people didn't change. I checked the everlasting truth once again, and I put my hand in my pocket. Then I grabbed a handful of its contents and dropped it bit by bit before throwing it at Belsaka's approaching face. Pooh, what's this? Cough. Suddenly, something like coarse powder was sprinkled on him, and Belsack, who was coughing in surprise, started laughing at me. Ha! This is all. KKKK. Just powder. Cough. Noisy, except this. I kept spraying it on Belsack's face so he can't talk. Well, stop. I sprinkled the leftover powder thoroughly on every corner of Belsack's body, look like thick salt spray on cabbage kimchi. Phew, it's done. I stopped when the bag finally got really thin. Pooh, you crazy. What are you doing? Hey, Belsack. Do you know what that powder is? I don't care. You're dead. Why don't you smell it? It was sprayed on your body. In my words, Belsack smelled the powder on his sleeve. Sniff. G.R. Grain. Oh, you got it right. It's a mixture of corn, sunflower seeds, millet and so on. It's going to be very delicious. That grain. Do you know how hard it is to get Suso grain these days? What, what? But lately I've been buying a lot of grain from there. I specially carry this between them. What the hell are you talking about? Belsack, who couldn't understand what I was saying, screamed. I said with a big smile as I took three steps back from him. What do you think? Flock bird food. Flap, flap. From a distance, I could hear wings getting closer and closer and closer. Heek, heek. Belsack may have heard it too, his face began to turn pale. So, you're afraid of birds, aren't you? It's one of the weaknesses Belsack hid. He is very afraid of birds. Point two, it's so bad that he doesn't eat chicken on the table. Oh, no. Belsack tried to run away when he saw the birds flying, but his legs were already looseness and he rolled around on the street in a bad way. Where are you going? I've made you a new meal with all my heart. Sa, save me. Paddock. Paddock. About thirty birds resting in a nearby tree rushed to Belsack at once. Ha! Ah. Belsack crouched down and tried to avoid it somehow, but they were looking for the finest western grain. The birds had no mercy. Fibic, chirping, goo goo. One it's so nice to see all kinds of miscellaneous birds playing. 
The birds, who had pecked carefully between Belsaka's clothes, hands, and hair, flew away without any regrets when the scattered grain were run out. Paddock. And where the birds had left, the crushed Belsack lay shabby. Hair torn and scattered, high dot end clothes torn, face teary and runny nose. Ha! Ha! You said you wanted to beat me up. But isn't that you now? Even with my teasing words, Belsack was terrified and unable to move. You've enjoyed the pain and fear of others. What about your own distress? Did you enjoy it? Ha, ha. I approached Belsack and looked down at the man lying on the floor with cold eyes. Just like he did to me. If you bother Craney one more time, it won't end as easy as it is now. I said it correctly, one by one, so that it could get stuck in Belsack's stupid head. Because I'll throw rats and birds away without your knowing, then throw you into a big bird's nest, paint your whole body with bird feed grain, then tie you tightly to pillars. Okay. Heek, heek, heek. It was terrible just to imagine, fear flashed through Belsack's eyes. I looked at the man disdainfully one last time, then turned away and walked. Oh, it's refreshing. I felt lighter without a feeding bag. Now there's no way Belsack is going to bother Craney. He's as scared as Astaliu. Someone had to protect Craney, but his brother Astaliu didn't have the courage to protest against Belsack. The parents, Laurels and Ronette, are busy reading V's mind. So I have no choice but to step up. Good job. Good boy. It was more than just revenge for Craney's bullying. What should I say? I feel my hurt in past life also healed. Little Florentia, who had no one to help like Craney, seemed relieved, though it was too late. Asterisk 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 a few days later. I came to the pellet company office. That's why our pellet company now holds the most southern grain harvested this year. Wow, great job. You too. It really wasn't easy. The South was a market that was tightly held by mid-sized to large dot-sized tops that traded for generations. But as a result of the hard work of the pellets, including Clarivan and Violet, we were able to buy large quantities of food. And as expected, a number of tops are sending love calls. 2. If you want to sell it to the East, you have to buy it with extra money. That's right. Clarivan handed me the list on the paper. These are the tops that have asked us so far. That's quite a lot. Well, let's see. I skimmed through the long list. Then I found the name I was looking for at the very end of the list. Here, write to them that you will sell about a quarter of what we have. Please give them a discount. What? That much? Yes, of course, we're going to have to hand out a little bit to the other tops. Because we're living together. In fact, it was meant to minimize troublesome time and jealousy. Violet tilted her head and opened her eyes round when he saw the name Tops that I pointed. Oh, this is the last time. Then she looked into my eyes. I smiled at Violet with the intention of believing in me. Soon Violet replied with a short nod. Okay, I'll send them a letter as you said at the top of Reds. Underscore 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 glossary one tip of the iceberg. The idiom means the small part of a much larger situation or problem that remains hidden. 2. Love calls. Means, somebody or yourself is attractive or attracted in you or hish. Chapter 100 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Emperor Jovans decided to attend the conference room where the aristocratic council was held. That's to end the last fierce eastern tax debate. Today Lombardy's face will be amazed. The sarcastic Furtick Anginas was heard by all the nobles around him. 
Ha ha. I'm looking forward to that. People around him were busy helping him with a word or two. Lord of Anginas shook his legs hoping the meeting would begin soon. In the past few days, Ferdic Anginas has been walking in and out of the palace gate. Every day he met the emperor to persuade him to collect taxes from the west. One, thanks to this, the emperor, who has little opinion at first, seemed to have completely crossed over to this side after hard work. He showed positive signs, listening and nodding whenever he spoke. Every time those things pile up one by one, Ferdic Anginas called for pleasure. We can finally beat Lolak Lombardy.2 It didn't matter what happened in the East. But, the fact that Lombardy's contempt on such a controversial political issue is largely symbolic. It also meant that the Emperor decided to support the Anginas, that Lombardy's status wasn't the same as before, and that the Anginas would eventually become the best family in the Empire. Ferdic Anginas intended to smile at Lolak Lombardy's face the moment the Emperor ordered to collect taxes in the West. 2. When the Anginas became so unbearable, the door to the conference room opened. Mm. But the Emperor wasn't alone. He was with Lolak Lombardy. Ha! Huh. Ferdic Anginas didn't like it but tried to pull himself together. No matter how eloquent Lolak Lombardy was, he will not be able to break the ball he collected for days at once. 3. The Emperor took the highest seat and start the meeting. It was the Emperor's turn, following the Chairman's brief opening remarks. Gulp. Ferdic Anginas clenched his fist invisible. The Lord's opinion on the severe drought in the East, which continued this year, was divided in half. Jovanza's loud voice rang throughout the conference room. I've read the opinions of both groups and I've pondered over them. To be honest, it's so simmering that it's hard to pick one hand. The emperor stopped talking and finally swept his beard as if he were agonizing over it. Even in that short of time, Ferdic Anginas was restless and go crazy. He squeezed the armrest of the chair with his sweaty hands. But I've made up my mind. Finally. Ferdic Anginas looked at Lolak Lombardy with a smile around his mouth. It just so happens that Lolak was looking this way. By the way, something was strange. One corner of Lolak's mouth was slowly facing up. Why are you laughing? I'm the one who will 1.1 at the moment, an ominous premonition passed strongly. And Yovans declared. I feel sorry for my people in the East who are suffering from drought, so I will not collect taxes this year. Oh, no. Ferdic Anginas screamed loudly at the moment. He tried to cover his mouth with one hand, but it was too late. The Emperor's eyebrow frowned and nobles were looking at Lord of Anginas. Are you dissatisfied with my decision? Jovans asked squeamishly. Well, it's not that. Ferdic Anginas quickly rolled his head and came up with an excuse. Last year. Didn't you already exempt from the eastern tax last year? However, I am worried that if we do so this year, the national treasury will be empty. Oh, I didn't know Anginas was so worried about my pockets. After all, the treasury was the property of the emperor. The emperor said he would not collect taxes in the east even if he lost money, so, the aristocrat had nothing to say. They just hoped the spark wouldn't hit them and the tax levy wouldn't rise. Well, of course. Anginas is always wholeheartedly for his majesty. Yes, for my sake, Anginas will have to pay enough taxes this year. Yes. Ferdic Anginas bit his tongue late but it was already spilled. Thank you, I am very grateful that I have lightened your heart, and I have vowed to pay more taxes this year in front of all the noble associations. Then I'll be back. After completing his business, Jovans left the conference room immediately. What has he done now? Ferdic and Ginas, leaning on the backrest, looked straight ahead. And met Lolak Lombardy's eyes again. Lolak Lombardy was smiling. It was the smile of the perfect winner. It was the same smile that Ferdic Anginas said he would make at a critical moment. Asterisk 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 Quang. The door to Pellet's office opened violently. 
Huff, huff. The owner of the panting breath in the doorway was none other than Bate. How did you know? Bate asked when he walked straight toward me. What's that? Instead of answering, I pointed to the heavy red box in Bate's hands. It's a dessert. I have to pretend to be a courier to come to Pellet in broad daylight. It's just like Bate. Moving forward, Bate placed the two heavy boxes on the table and plopped down in front of me. Please tell me. How did you know that? Oh, I guess you've heard about the East. I asked again as I looked at Clarivan, nodded his head, he carried a plate to move the dessert to make it easier to eat. That's. Oh, that strawberry, Clarivan. Yes, Lady Florentia. Oh, come on. Bate couldn't stand it and looked at me reluctantly. I should stop teasing you. You're going to cry. Why did Bate think that the emperor would collect taxes in the east from the beginning? That's it. Bate answered my question easily. If we don't collect taxes for whatever reason, we don't have the state treasury. Besides, this isn't the first time, so the burden will be even greater. And Bates' explanation was a little longer. It's inevitable because there's so much information he knows. Bates' words ended only when I ate the whole piece of cake, I got a little more greedy and ended up eating more half cake than Violet gave me. Yeah, you're right. Yes, but why not? The Emperor decided to betray all these reasons, and did Lady Florentia know that? Certainly, this time, as Bates said, it would have been right to collect taxes from the East. But there's one important fact that Bate didn't know. My words made Bate's face serious. What's that? It is that Emperor Jovans is a very greedy man. Greedy? Yeah, it's more than people think. For the Emperor, greed was a genetic trait that had been handed down for generations. But Jovans is more prominent. But then all the more tax. Paying. What if there was any other way for Emperor Jovans to take advantage of the imperial people by not collecting taxes in the East this year? Another. Way. I showed a piece of paper to Bate, who was at a loss. It was part of Violet's report today. This is the current state of the grain possessed by the Empire's top ranks. Bate read the paper carefully. There are some familiar names there. Our pellet company, and Lombardy's tops in rank 4-2, right? Yes, but what clues does this have? Bate asked as if he couldn't stand the question, though his pride was very hurt. Not long ago, Lombardy was the second on the list. But why did they fall so far? Without suddenly having a fire in the warehouse if it's selling it in bulk to someone. But it would be a big loss. Right, Lombardy sold a lot of its grain to the other top. Right up here. I pointed out the name of a top with my fingertips. It was the sixth on the list. Red. Tops. Bate frowned. I've never heard of that name before. Maybe so. It's a newly built tops. But how can they have so much food? Our pellet company also sold a lot of to them. How come? Think about it. Who would have the money to buy this amount of grain at once although a new tops, and not available for free? Ho, oh, maybe. Yes, this red tops is belong to Emperor Jovans. Bates' mouth opened silently in astonishment. And with the help of Lombardy, the red's tops are going up to the far east. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. I understand Bates' feelings. It would be frustrating not to be able to read the whole picture because you didn't know one piece of information. Bate, who dropped his head, with a despondent smile, said. I admit, I. I've completely lost. I don't mean to comfort you after winning. This isn't because Bates' ability is insufficient. It's just that the level of information coming in hasn't been high yet. On the other hand, I was more aware of internal affairs. And another difference is. Bate looked at me. Bate is just a person who collects information from outside, and I am a person who directly intervenes in important things that can be informed. Direct intervention. 
I'm a person with the ability to generate information. Bates' brilliant amber eyes shone brilliantly. Oh, and the fact that I've experienced Emperor Jovans and my grandfather in person. This was actually my advantage over Bate as well as anyone else. Who would have predicted that the tops of Lombardy would sell the grain he had at a loss and carry the tops of the Reds up? What's the reason? My grandfather hates losing as much as I do. That's enough to step on Angina's. I shrugged my shoulders. I would have done the same. Bate, who became quiet, was lost in thought again. And when he looked up at me again, I asked, feeling like I was casting the last fishing rod. For, what do you think, Bait? Why don't you work with me? It was a great achievement to have Bait and Caramel Avenue on my side. So I throw another bait. While you're working with me, rent is free. All right, let's do that. Bait snapped and took the bait. We look forward to your kind cooperation, the landlord. Bait reached out to me. I look forward to your kind cooperation too, Bait. I said to myself, this is great. I got it, and held her hand tightly. Underscore 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 glossary, one, Western. Well actually Aristocracy Council is now discussing Eastern tax. So I thought this one is a mistake made by the author, it should be, Eastern, not, Western. Refer to line 2 and 14 this chapter and chapter 98 when Tia provoked bait, plus, 2, well this one is also Western is it really me a take? Eastern is Rumen and Western is Anginas, Prev Brown Fams. I was forget whose family territory get drought this year. Is it Rumen? 3. Lit. Ball. If we look at the sentence it's same as, play the ball, that mean, put efforts into something slash somebody. Ferdic Anginas put effort to convince the emperor. 4. Like, throw the bait.